Hey friends, welcome back to the journal feed. My name is Nick Zelt and this is the only place where I spoon feed you guys the latest and greatest of emergency medicine. Now, if you are hearing this right now, then you are not currently a journal feed subscriber and so you will not be receiving the full journal feed podcast, only getting a portion of the past week's articles. If you would like to get full access to both the podcast and the blog, then you'll have to become a member. All the details for that are at journalfeed.org. And remember, we never want money to be a barrier to better patient care. So if you're having any trouble affording a subscription, just get in touch. We'll help you out. This is the audio version of the past week summaries, which were brought to you by our authors, Catherine Solkowski, Katan Patel, Shannon Marcus, Amanda Matthews, Carmen Wolf, Joshua Belfer, and Clay Smith. Okay, so let's kick things off with the first article, titled Increasing Risk of Tick-Borne Disease, What Should Clinicians Know? Out of the JAMA Internal Medicine. While the title kind of says it all, let's talk a little bit about tick-borne diseases. There's something that is becoming increasingly common in a lot of areas. Thanks to that lovely thing called climate change, global warming, what have you, the distribution of tick-borne diseases has been changing in the United States, even spreading up into Canada. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this. Uh, Some things have to do with that it's getting warmer and thus it's not cold enough to kill off or deter some of the populations that would otherwise not be going in some areas and spreading tick-borne diseases. And there's a blossoming white-tailed deer population, which is a vector for ticks, and depending on where they hang around, is not amenable to being hunted out. Not that I necessarily encourage that kind of thing so much, not a hunter myself. All the same, if you've got deer in your backyard, then you could be at risk for tick-borne diseases. Then, of course, there's the general aging of our population, which can increase the severity of disease as well. So that's a bit about the spread of the ticks themselves. Besides that, we're getting a lot better at diagnosing tick-borne diseases. There are a huge multitude of tests that we can now do that have decent turnaround times, and so we're actually recognizing a lot more of these diseases that we otherwise wouldn't have. This, luckily, helps us treat, but it also means we might be doing a lot of unnecessary testing. Not to mention that it's not so uncommon to have patients who think that they have, say, chronic Lyme disease causing symptoms that probably are not caused by chronic Lyme disease. So that's a conversation that I've certainly had more than once, and I'm sure that you have as well. There are a lot of patients that you should consider testing. When it comes to Lyme disease, they recommend diagnostic testing on anyone who has a fever who's coming from an endemic area who you think it could possibly be caused by Lyme disease. If they have a rash over 5 centimeters across and it's been expanding over the last couple of days and you think that rash is erythema migrans and it all makes sense, then don't do any testing, just treat. That's the recommendation of these authors as well as the CDC. If the treatment doesn't seem to be working, then consider Borrelia infections. Borreliosis being pretty much the only tick-borne disease which is not going to be treated by doxycycline. All the rest treated by doxycycline. But of course, the best thing you can do is not get bitten in the first place. So be mindful when you're going through tick endemic areas. Try to wear protective clothing, use DEET as a repellent or other bug repellents, and then removing ticks as you find them. When you get home, it's nice to do a nice quick check just to make sure there's not any ticks anywhere. That includes on your children. If you'd like to keep up to date on all things tick-borne diseases, then the CDC has a lovely PDF, which is linked in the blog, that you can read over. There's lots of wonderful pictures about what each of these ticks look like and a lot of information about diagnosis and treatment. A lovely resource for anybody that lives anywhere near an endemic area. In a spoonful, keep tick-borne diseases in mind, even in places that were not previously considered endemic. And diagnose Lyme clinically when erythema migrans is present. Treat without confirmatory testing. All right, then let's skip to the third article. Titled, Full Dose Challenge of Moderate, Severe, and Unknown Beta-Lactam Allergies in the Emergency Department out of the journal Academic Emergency Medicine. Now, I am a big fan of getting rid of untrue penicillin allergies. We've covered the PenFast tool. We've covered using the PenFast tool to challenge allergies in an allergy clinic. How about challenging allergies in the emergency department? And not just fake allergies, the ones that are reported as being moderate to severe. 
This was a retrospective chart review of patients who had a documented moderate, severe, or unknown beta-lactam allergy who then received a full dose of a beta-lactam antibiotic in the emergency department. It's not clear how entirely these patients were identified. It seems like they just chart reviewed and saw people who got both of these things. I'm presuming that these patients were challenged on purpose, but it's not clear how that decision was made. I guess they have some protocol at this hospital which encourages them to do that. Moderate reactions were patients who had hives, urticaria, or swelling that was not of the head or neck. Severe reactions had anaphylaxis or swelling of the mouth, lips, tongue, or throat, or difficulty breathing. Unknown reactions were not listed or the patient just didn't know, which is probably a lot of the time in real life. They had 850 patients who were screened, 184 patients were included in the study. They excluded things that were probably not allergies to begin with, like patients that were just reported previous intolerances or who had already tolerated another beta-lactam antibiotic. All of these patients were admitted to the hospital, which makes sense because they were getting IV antibiotics, but is unfortunate because I still like to be able to discharge patients on antibiotics that I want to put them on. Most of these patients were being treated for pneumonias or UTIs. And ceftriaxone was the most common antibiotic that was given 83% of the time to challenge these allergies. And as you might expect, only 2.7, that's 5 out of the 184 patients, developed an allergic reaction after a full dose of a beta-lactam was administered. Most of the time, again, being ceftriaxone. All reactions were limited to mild reactions of rash or itching. There was no documented anaphylactic reactions. One patient actually had their reaction in the emergency department and the other four after their admission. After admission, 86% of patients continued beta-lactam antibiotics, but for some reason only 73% of the patients actually had an update of their electronic medical record that said that yes, indeed, they can tolerate these antibiotics. That's unfortunate that so many people did not get that update. That's silly. We need to have access to that kind of thing to update it so that these patients can get these antibiotics with no problem in the future. Now, these are patients who had just reported generally beta-lactam allergies. We've actually linked on the blog post to an article which we covered in 2021, which included in the article a very handy chart on antibiotic cross-reactivity, which I think you should take a picture of with your phone because it's a really nice, useful resource to have on shift. What matters more than the beta-lactam is the side chain, which is what most people are actually allergic to most of the time. And as a result, there's not actually that much cross-reactivity. It really depends on what you were allergic to in the first place. If you have a penicillin allergy and I'm giving you ceftriaxone, then yeah, the cross-reaction rates are going to be very low. I'm more interested in outpatient challenges, where I'm going to challenge this patient and then send them home on an antibiotic. I already don't fret that much about giving ceftriaxone to patients with penicillin allergies, so this isn't going to change my practice that much, but it's still nice to see this kind of thing. In a spoonful, this is yet another example of penicillin allergies being very low risk of being actual allergies, especially when you're challenging with a cephalosporin, even in patients with previous anaphylaxis. Okay, that's our five articles. Let's do a quick wrap-up of everything that we talked about today. From the first article, we did a quick public service announcement that tick-borne diseases are increasing in frequency and expanding in geography. From the third article, don't be scared to question beta-lactam allergies. They're unlikely to be real. It's unlikely to cross-react with ceftriaxone, at least seen in this article. And the emergency department is honestly the best place to test that kind of thing out. Again, if you are hearing this right now, then you are not a part of the members feed. And so you missed three articles from this past week that the members did get and you didn't. The articles you missed were about, well, one was about a one-hour sepsis bundle and whether or not that's saving lives. Then we talked about using acetaminophen to deoxify your blood and whether or not this is saving lives in the ICU. And finally, a review of botulism, something to keep your eye on. Links to all the original articles can be found at journalfeed.org. Just follow the links in your show notes. Our goal here is for you to read less, learn more, and save lives, one spoonful at a time. <laughs>